Uh, good morning uh, to everyone in the United States from Washington, DC, and good very late evening to uh, those watching in Korea and other parts of Asia. Uh, I'm Kathleen Stevens. I'm the president of the Korea Economic Institute, KEI. And I'm very pleased to uh, be co-hosting today this uh, event with uh, the Asia Foundation. I also happen to be the vice chair of the board and the executive committee at the Asia Foundation. And I really wanna thank uh, the staff of both KEI and the Asia Foundation, in particular, Nancy Yuan, the senior vice president and director of the Asia Foundation's Washington DC office for asking KEI to co-host, I think this very significant event. Uh, before we get into it, I do have to say a word about the Asia Foundation, especially for maybe for our KEI watchers. Uh, uh, the Asia Foundation is very familiar to anyone who's, who's been working in Asia over the years. Uh, it still has 18 Asian offices spread across Asia doing extraordinary work. Its history in Korea is remarkable. Uh, I'd love to talk more about it at some other uh, seminar perhaps, but uh, the Asia Foundation has supported Korea's dramatic development from an aid recipient to a donor nation. Uh, since 1954. And it still has an office in Korea, which now works closely with Korean, South Korean NGOs and the Korean government, including the Korea Development in, uh, Institute, KDI, and COICA, its overseas development arm, to build capacity and expand their official development assistance through joint development projects, training, and knowledge exchanges. And I am struck today by how many Koreans I meet who, who talk about what the Asia Foundation did in the early years and subsequently in Korea uh, on South Korea's extraordinary journey. But today we're here because the Asia Foundation has produced a report, which I think is very meaningful, uh, that looks at the experience of North Korean refugees uh, in South Korea uh, looking to go into business as entrepreneurs. Uh, I think that you'll find this report uh, uh, in the uh, chat room uh, or in the Q&A function, I think in the chat room. And uh, we also send it, I think, in the invitation. So I think many of you have already seen it. But what we'd like to do today is to ask the, uh, the prime author of this report, who indeed is the uh, Korea Foundation's uh, head of office uh, in Seoul to talk about it and then have a discussion about it. It's, uh, uh, I think, a, a important because it's a data-driven report that looks uh, in, a, in a new way into that uh, growing emerging community of North Koreans who have resettled uh, in South Korea over the past uh, decade or so, a little bit more than a decade now, some now some over 30,000 uh, people, and who, and especially those who aspire to go into business and as I said, become entrepreneurs. Uh, I haven't seen another study like this. I think it's going to help us understand more how North Korean refugees are uh, being a, uh, adapting and settling into uh, South Korean society. Is a positive story, I believe. I look forward to hearing our speakers about it. Uh, it shows, uh, I think, uh, uh, some uh, success and resilience, uh, even in the face of many challenges. And it's also part of the broader South Korean story of South Korea society uh, opening itself to uh, those who do face uh, particular challenges uh, and come from outside mainstream, if you like, South Korean society and culture. And the report does offer some, some recommendations on how South Korea can successfully implement uh, its agenda of economic and social inclusion, uh, not only for North Korean refugee entrepreneurs, but even uh, more broadly. So with that, I want to turn to our uh, speakers. Uh, we are going to uh, hear first and for first of all from Kim uh, Kwang Kim, who, as I mentioned, is the country representative of the Asia Foundation's Korea office. He led the publication of this report, which has been in the works for some time. Uh, he is an expert on sustainable development and public-private partnership. He previously worked in the private sector arm of the World Bank Group and advised foreign governments on economic diversification strategies. After uh, Kwong presents the report and speaks about it, <clears throat> we have two uh, commentators. Uh, first, Scott Snyder, who himself is a Asia Foundation Korea office alumni or uh, a former head. He was the uh, country representative of the Asia Foundation in Seoul from 2000 to, uh, to 2004. Many of you will know him uh, from his current perch as Senior Fellow for Korean Studies and Director of the Program on US-Korea Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations here in Washington. And we're also very pleased to be joined by Randall Jones, who is a non-resident fellow at KEI and a professional fellow at Columbia University. Dr. Jones comes to us from a long career of over three decades at the OECD, where he headed the Japan-Korea desk at the OECD and has published uh, numerous articles about South Korea's economy. So with that, uh, and with one more, I guess, uh, logistical uh, note that uh, uh, we are going to use the Q&A function 
uh, for questions. So please submit all your questions through that and we will be sure and leave uh, plenty of time for discussion and questions uh, towards the end of this hour. So with that, let me turn to Kwong Kim uh, from Seoul. Thank you for staying up to join us. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Stevens, and, and good morning. Uh, thank you for joining uh, for this, uh, uh, this report launch of North Korean ref refugee entrepreneurs in South Korea. Um, I'm trusting that everybody can see my screen. Um, North Korea is often viewed as a security, humanitarian, and human rights concern, as you know, and these are important. But to better understand North Korea and North Koreans, we have not tapped into sufficiently into a rich community who are bringing their experiences in coping a new life in South Korea, as well as in other countries like the United States right now. Rather than seeing them mainly through political or humanitarian lenses, we can gain, all of us can gain a better understanding if you look at them as entrepreneurs and citizens. What I'll do today is present on the context of our study, key findings and challenges, lessons from other programs and recommendations. First, why we started the study? Um, one of the key reasons is to gain a more nuanced understanding of this important community. Many of us can imagine the hardships and challenges they have to go through leaving their homes and the difficult journey they have to go through South Korea. We see movie, movies about it and so forth. But once they arrive in the South, their lives have not been well understood even within South Korea, as well as by the international community. Often there is less positive or simple characterization by the media. So one contribution we hope to make in this report is to bring more light about who they are uh, through the lenses of entrepreneurship. The second reason is that this report can provide a micro level window to understand the present and future of inter-Korean relations. The lives of refugee entrepreneurs can provide an indication to what a, even a, what a future of an integrated North-South may look like. Their success or failure will be watched carefully by their family members and friends in the North. So we have a stake in their success. Third, there's a lot of uh, lack of data and information. Um, except for a few studies in Korean, which we cite in the report, data was very hard to find. Our study is an attempt to fill this gap and validate some of the existing data with additional questions for the future. The precise number of refugee entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs is not certain. Um, different studies estimate this to be between 1,100 to 4,000 out of, out of 33,000 refugees in South Korea. And our study introduces additional business frameworks, greater scope of business data, stock taking and lessons from other programs, detailed recommendations, and is intended to both international and Korean audiences. Finally, this report has implications to other refugee and immigrant, uh, immigrant communities in Asia. The analysis and recommendations can provide inspiration to other societies that are trying to better integrate minority communities into larger societies. So let's start with some of the findings. Out of the 33,000 North Korean refugees in South Korea, that's the universe of the population, um, about half of them, according to a national survey, um, have entrepreneur aspiration. That's a big number. And one of the key uh, reasons seems to be, I'll discuss in the, in the, in the next, um, in, the, in the forward, but it's there because of the hierarchical structures in South Korea and uh, they've preferred more of the, more of the, the freedom to start on their own. Um, but that's an interesting uh, data point that about half of the refugees have entrepreneurial aspirations. Out of the 131 entrepreneurs that we surveyed, 65% uh, is female, so majority is female, which reflects the, uh, the population of refugees, the, the majority is female. They are in their 30s and 40s, 
and they came to South Korea uh, 10 years ago or, or before. They're micro and small, most of them earning uh, less than $48,000 a year, mainly in the service sector, uh, especially food and retail, but also transportation, logistics, and business services. It's also interesting to note that they work longer hours than South Korean workers, but earn 35% less. So that's an interesting gap to point out. Now, why, why is this interest in entrepreneurship? A big reason for the North Korean refugee entrepreneurs is because of freedom and status. A, a sense of succeeding in South Korea. Again, many have a hard time adjusting to life in the South. And for them, su succeeding on their own uh, with businesses is a big deal. And there is also, interestingly, a gap between the aspiring entrepreneurs and the actual entrepreneurs using different set of data at most, at the very most, uh, only about um, no more than 12% are actual entrepreneurs than the aspiration. Just to compare the national data of the actual um, entrepreneurs in South Korea is about 20%. So this is a, there is a gap. So why? Why is it the, why, the why is, what's the reason? There are some pointers to this and our report identifies some top business challenges. At the pre-venture stage and they're before or about to start a business, um, initial funding in the form of startup financing is key, um, but also networking information, that's a, that's a big gap. In the post-venture, after they've proven their business model, a year or two or so, getting marketing, this marketing itself is a huge challenge. In a report, this is shown as sometimes an excessive competition. It also shows that their business model is a lot about competing with the same product and service, very similar products and services with little differentiation. The entrepreneurs also desire to penetrate new markets, such as online and e-commerce, but lacks information, resources, networks. Again, this theme of networks keeps coming back. And again, the fact that they don't have, they haven't cultivated that net, network to high schools and universities and, and companies, which is very uh, important in South Korean society, um, that there is a lack of, of, of such networks. There, there's also growth financing, so different type of financing that startup and, and, and cash, flow, cash flow operating financing. And, and also managing their financials and cash flow management is interestingly an interesting challenge. There's a gap between invoicing and payment, and this actually can make or break a business. So this has been, uh, the report points out, uh, problematic for a lot of these uh, the North Korean uh, refugees. Cultural language is very important. This is important for at least two, in two dimensions. One is that refugees' own assumptions about the capitalistic, a capitalistic system and functioning in a com com competitive society. For example, one interviewee heard about a family member who got a driver's license. Then he assumed that the license must come with a car. So there was an expectation about the society, how the society functions. There's also discrimination, but this is a bit more complex. We have data that shows that they do face discrimination. Their accent and appearance may have impact in actual sales. But four out of five in our study responded that do not face discrimination, which is consistent with the majority of other studies we found, except perhaps one. The majority experience cultural and language barriers in functioning a market-based society, but this is different than pure straightforward discrimination. In some, the North Korean refugee entrepreneurs, they face real challenges. Some, there, some of them are unique, but they are many ways similar to other micro and small firms in South Korea. So what are the implications of this study? Before looking to the recommendation, I wanted to quickly um, 
look at the other existing programs to support North Korean uh, entrepreneurs in South Korea. We tried to do some stock taking and we're grateful for the lessons learned that we learn, that we learn from them uh, whenever we can find. And to be honest, it was very difficult uh, to find uh, information about these programs. We examined nine other support programs, five NGOs, three private sector, and one government. Um, evalu evaluation data was almost non-existent. It's very, very difficult. So a lot of this anecdotal. But the key emerging findings were the following. One is that greater customization is needed to better tailor the programs to North Korea refugees. There are also communication gaps, not just the difference between North Korean and Korean and the South Korean dialect, but also difference between mindset and culture and, 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 and behavior. There are also issues with incentives to the participants. So the common way to uh, have them participate is through cash incentives. But our conversations are led to believe that um, asking them to participate in a business upside as part of the program, for example, uh, startup funding, uh, that could be potentially more effective. Also, it's important to link intervention with results. None of the programs that we looked um, had a direct uh, link to results and leading many of the participants to drop out of the programs. And, and lastly, the sustainability of these projects. One project launched almost 20 new business, which is impressive, but it was abruptly stopped, stopped because of lack of funding. So careful planning and exit is an important consideration. This is my last slide. So an agenda for action, what's the recommendation? The first one is, it seems simple, it's straightforward, but strengthening the overall SME policy environment, the environment in South Korea, if the SME environment is strong, uh, the North Koreans also benefit. Um, but this is not just uh, general, there, there, there's also a need to focus on tailored uh, interventions such as tailored funding windows for their needs, networking mentoring, and, and training uh, pedagogies. So it, it requires much more customization. And also, as I mentioned before, is supporting uh, results, intervention with results. We have piloted a program to train entrepreneurs that was used to help East German entrepreneurs after unification. And we had some promising results so far. Our work is very tiny, given the needs of the North Korean refugees, much more is needed. Also comprehensive business support and networking rather than piecemeal programs. And um, this is a key to integrate refugees to the rest of society and the international community. Startup incubation accelerator support could provide some of the networks, mentors, market access and information. And this it exists currently in, in South Korea, though we will welcome collaboration with international partners as well as funding. Finally, celebrate entrepreneur success and this culture creating effect of celebrating. Uh, the goal here is to raise the profile and honor these entrepreneurs in society. High profile award programs, award, awards programs have shown to be a powerful way to celebrate a culture of entrepreneurship in societies by partnering with media, the government, the private sector. To conclude, we have much to learn on who this refugee entrepreneurs are, how to best work with them as partners. And we don't have all the answers, uh, not even all the questions. And but I hope this study will shed some light of about them. Their success will be the success of the Korean people and other minority groups striving to succeed in a new environment. The ones I met are not perfect, but still very inspiring to see how they, and to see how they make things work despite many, many obstacles. I invite you to get to know them better. Thank you. Thank you, Kwong. I know this is going to stimulate a lot of questions, and uh, I already see a couple in the uh, Q&A box, but I do encourage people as we continue the discussion to, uh, to add to them. And I, I have a pretty long list of my own. It's a very, uh, uh, <laughs> it's a topic that stimulates that. And to turn now to, to start our discussion, I'm gonna turn to uh, Scott Snyder from the Council on Foreign Relations. You need to unmute, Scott. Sorry about that. 
Um, thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Kwong, for a really interesting study. And in fact, I think that this study exemplifies a lot of the Asia Foundation's strengths uh, in terms of being able to bring uh, local knowledge and facts on the ground uh, in a framework uh, that addresses important governance issues uh, and that helps to close the gaps, uh, in this case within South Korean society. Uh, and so I want to commend you for that. It's really a unique study. Uh, but I also want to try to put the study into a little bit of context as I think back about um, efforts to understand the implications of Korean division and the possibilities for Korean unification, which has been a longstanding area of academic interest. Uh, I recall South, Korea, South Korean scholarship picking up on this area, especially in the 1990s in the context of uh, German unification. Uh, and then in the 2000s, becoming even more active uh, as the flow of former North Korean citizens into the South grew in the context of the famine and the arduous march. Uh, and, you know, the main focus of study during that period really revolved around South Korean governmental efforts to build out a support infrastructure for North Korean refugee adaptation to life in South Korea and also to address the psychological challenges uh, that North Korean refugees faced in adapting to a different system uh, in South Korea. Uh, and really a lot of those studies uh, ended up being driven by um, thinking about the types of governmental support and civil society inputs needed to facilitate that, that process. But, but I think this report takes a different approach uh, and it's really one that focuses uh, in a way from the individual out rather than from the uh, perspective of what government can do uh, through the lens of entrepreneurship, uh, focusing on the risks and opportunities uh, and, and looking at entrepreneurship as a mechanism for adaptation and integration uh, into South Korean life. Um, and I think that this focus on entrepreneurial experiences frames the individual experience of coping with and trying to solve everyday problems as normal and common, uh, rather than framing the North Korean refugee experience in terms of differences, obstacles, or exclusion. Uh, this approach obviously, uh, as is apparent from the report, doesn't deny that North Korean entrepreneurs have to work harder or, or that they face discrimination or greater barriers to entry than South Korean counterparts. Uh, but the focus on overcoming uh, these obstacles can help narrow the differences. And I think the poly policy prescriptions uh, in particular are notable uh, in this respect. Uh, and I also go back and just uh, highlight uh, the statistic uh, that uh, Kwong focused on in the report about the aspiration of 50% of North Korean refugees to become entrepreneurs. Uh, and this makes a lot of sense uh, because it's probably a pathway that is perceived uh, as circumventing obstacles to integration in South Korea that might derive from class uh, or social rigidities. And so even though this report on entrepreneurship really focuses on a relatively small group of people, it provides a community-based integration approach based on personal capacities and contributions rather than on state-based policy engineering. And I think the aspiration for entrepreneurship and the regulatory obstacles to such efforts may turn out to be more a commonality than a difference uh, between life in North and South Korea as entrepreneurs move from North to South. But in North Korea, I imagine that entrepreneurship is really the nail that sticks up against rigid uh, political and social controls. Uh, but in South Korea, entrepreneurship ideally can be a type of glue that fills, cracks, circumvents, and holds together pre-existing social structures. And so I just want to address three themes of the report that stood out to me. Um, resiliency, adaptability, and integration. Um, first, resiliency. I, I think the report really shows how North Korean entrepreneurs face the same problems as South Korean counterparts, especially as related to financing, tax reporting, and marketing challenges in terms of conducting uh, a business profitably. Um, 
these are challenges not of type but of degree. Uh, and North Korean entrepreneurs do not have pre-existing benefits of social networks, but they find ways to generate social networks apart from hometown or school ties. And so in that sense, I think entrepreneurship provides a pathway that can circumvent organizational culture and in-group barriers uh, to some degree. Um, uh, the pathway for North Koreans um, to make their own way in South Korean society without burdens, restrictions, or intrusions uh, of the North Korean state into private life. Uh, lowering of the barriers to entry can make a difference for people who are highly motivated and willing to work hard and make a living for themselves and for their families. The second characteristic that was notable is adaptability and North Korean refugee entrepreneurs are showing grit uh, by doing what they can to make a living in a new environment uh, in South Korea. Uh, but they're working in an environment where the level of support that they can expect from the state is flipped on its head uh, in ways that confound their prior experience. And I think the most striking example of that from the uh, interviews uh, was about uh, discussions of uh, exchange uh, in, a, in a low trust society, uh, which required cash on delivery uh, versus uh, North Koreans trying to adapt to a deferred payment system backed by rule of law, but then North Korean uh, refugee entrepreneurs face challenges uh, related to financing uh, that are new and very difficult uh, as uh, in, in a new uh, social uh, and systemic context. Uh, and then also it's striking the reality for these entrepreneurs is that most of them are just trying to uh, eke out a living uh, at less than $44,000 a year in terms of uh, the size of their uh, uh, businesses uh, in 2017. And then the last point I wanted to talk about is integration. And I think that uh, successful North Korean refugee entrepreneurship provides a pathway to earn a living and, and creates space and status for successful North Korean entrepreneurs in South Korea uh, without having to climb the rungs of a cradle to grave South Korean social hierarchy. Uh, yet the adaptability and know-how required to succeed as a North Korean refugee entrepreneur in South Korean society ultimately may prove most valuable as an experience and model for success in terms of influencing the future development of economic opportunity in North Korea. Uh, I think this would be the case to the extent that North Koreans see their successes, see the successes of North Korean refugee entrepreneurs as transferable or replicable uh, in the future, uh, especially as the North Korean economy really has no choice but to reform, transform, or integrate uh, with the South. And so I have just a few, I have three questions for Kwong also that I just wanted to uh, leave off with. And, and the first one is, uh, if you were the South Korean Minister of Unification uh, in charge of implementing these report recommendations uh, to support North Korean entrepreneurs, um, what kind of budget would you allocate and what kind of customized uh, business support training program would you put into place? Uh, the second question is whether you would uh, do this just in the context of the Ministry of Unification or whether there is some other part of the Korean bureaucracy that would be more appropriate uh, to house such a program? Uh, and my third question is, um, what would you do or what steps are needed to guard against poor use of or misappropriation of capital, capital and loans uh, in the course of supporting entrepreneurship among North Koreans uh, who have come to the experience of uh, entrepreneurship in South Korea from a completely different social context from that of North, North Korea. Um, and with that, um, I'll turn it back over. Scott, that's terrific. I'm going to give Kwong the choice if he wants to go ahead and address those questions now with an, uh, before we turn to Randall. Uh, that's great. Or if you want to wait and hold, hold on, I'll, I'll try to remind you of those questions later. Which would you prefer? Um, if Randall doesn't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll extract it when it's hot. Um, I'll, I'll be trying to be quick. Uh, excellent uh, questions. And I'm trying to put my former uh, experience at the World Bank in developing SME programs. 
And uh, in terms of the, the actual um, government, the Ministry of Unification will need to be a, a key player in all this. Um, uh, if, uh, I would rather consider a, is more of an intervening ministerial so that this crosses different types of ministries like Ministry of SMEs. So it will, it will be um, the advantage of doing an intermediate structure which the Ministry of Unification could coordinate. Um, but in terms of the actual uh, policy recommendations, um, uh, uh, just doing a very quick back, back in the napkin calculation, I'll divide it mainly in, mainly in two different windows. Uh, the first window will be some type of a pre-venture support and financing. And this will include um, the direct financing to um, pre-venture. This has to be in the form of soft grants and uh, for, for example, uh, with networking and incubator support. Um, and this is probably the biggest funding gap and um, to support about 16,000 entrepreneurs out of, of which is about close to half who the, aspires to become uh, in a light touch uh, support. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just estimating here tens of million. I'll, I'll put 40 million there, US. The window two will be venture support and financing. And this will be for financing technical support. Um, but the advantage here is that because they already have some level of growth, the, the, the partnership with the private sector could be significant. So it, it could leverage two to four times this funding that we raise. I'm going to guess between 30 to 35 million. Uh, so a bit less public funding needed uh, after show that your business model works. Um, and this, I estimate this could support about 3,000 firms among the existing and potential. Um, so all in all, I'm just putting a nap back in the napkin calculation of $75 million if anybody's interested in writing a check. Thanks for the precision. Thank you. All right, uh, Randall, let's turn to you. Oh, we cannot hear you. Unmute, please. Just say, I'm sorry, I can't provide that check, but I would be uh, very happy to give any ideas that uh, I have. Um, thank you very much for this paper and thanks to Scott for his interesting comments. Um, at the OECD, we spent a lot of time thinking, why is entrepreneurship so weak in South Korea? Why is it driven by Chebol? And why is the gap between small companies and large companies so huge and growing over time? Um, so it's encouraging to see one group in uh, South Korea this uh, very special group of North Korean refugees who have a, a big interest in entrepreneurship. Uh, for example, the uh, Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which asks various countries about their views on entrepreneurship, Korea ranked only 37th out of 60 countries. And only 34% of South Koreans had a positive view about entrepreneurship. And the reasons they usually give are, well, um, everything's already done by the Chebol. There's no opportunity for someone to start up, or I don't have the education and the training to start a company, or if I fail, the costs of failure are very large and there's little opportunity for a second chance. So Korea, South Korea is a country where uh, entrepreneurship has not been a major driver. In the past it was, we think about people like uh, Jung Joo Young who started uh, Hyundai and in fact came from North Korea, uh, but that was uh, a long time ago and those companies they found it seem to dominate the, uh, the uh, economy. And of course, in recent years, the government has taken many efforts to try to stimulate entrepreneurship, the uh, ecosystem for startups and the venture business and what have you. I think it's useful in thinking about entrepreneurship to separate between the necessity driven entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs who are uh, taking an opportunity because of uh, they have a good chance, a good uh, a way to make money. Uh, Necessity-driven entrepreneurs uh, in, among the North Koreans seem to be quite a large share because as the report states, um, the refugees, it says, um, this is, um, they cite a mix of economic factors, e.g. the broad wage gap between North and South Korean employees and cultural factors for the decision to become entrepreneurs. And this big wide uh, wage gap difference that you cited, 35% uh, less for North Koreans even though they work four or five days more uh, for each month. Uh, it's kind of surprising in a sense that 
so many North Koreans want to turn to entrepreneurship, given that South Korea faces labor shortages. Uh, the SMEs employ about 87% of the workforce, but about 81% of them, according to the 2018 survey by the, um, the Korea Institute of Small Business, 81% can't find enough workers. And so that would suggest that, uh, that uh, rather than trying to go overseas and find trainees or really workers, that South Korean companies would be anxious to snap up these Korean speaking North Korean refugees. Uh, already we have about 300,000 uh, Southeast Asians who come to Korea to work in SMEs under the employment permit system. And reportedly another 400,000 of undocumented workers, basically people who overstayed their visa and work. So rather than turn to Southeast Asians or uh, these illegal aliens, it seemed like you'd have a very, uh, a very valuable workforce that's, uh, that's waiting. So this suggests problems either in, in um, the education and training of North Korean refugees, a lack of job counseling or what's available, and then to some extent discrimination, which we talked about. The other group is the opportunity entrepreneurs who find opportunities uh, in starting a business that are better than being employees. And so, as you said, it's important to strengthen the overall environment for both South Korean and uh, North Korean refugees to make it easier to, uh, to start a business. And in fact, I noted in this report that 53.4% um, uh, said that financing was a key problem. That's the same for South Korean entrepreneurs. And especially for uh, expanding, 63% um, who want to expand said that uh, financing was a key problem for 61%. So financing really is a key problem. And the South North Korean refugee SMEs are extremely small, as you pointed out. They're the most micro of micro enterprises. Uh, 61% have less than three workers. So I think uh, financing is always the issue we have to address. In Korea, as in other countries, SMEs don't have enough collateral. They don't have the uh, credit history or the expertise to uh, do the financial reporting in order to get a bank loan. South Korea is very generous in giving direct funding to SMEs. They give a large amount of credit guarantees for SMEs. Um, but these aren't, haven't been really effective in helping SMEs to grow. So I think finding better ways to finance the venture business, all this fintech stuff that we, we hear about is something that should be pursued. In terms of collateral, of course, North Koreans are at a disadvantage because they don't tend to have real estate. The report noted something I didn't realize that two thirds of them live in government provided housing. So they don't have the, the house to put up as collateral that a South Korean entrepreneur would, would do. So I think we have to improve the whole overall environment for um, entrepreneurs and start educating, even in primary school, uh, the option and the skills necessary to be an entrepreneur. So this becomes a more uh, popular and uh, uh, feasible idea for young people. Just like to close with one question for Kwong that really kind of goes to the heart of this. Um, in the preface, it states that um, North Korean entrepreneurs in the South stay in touch with their families and friends in the north. And it also points out, I think this preface was written by um, Professor Lenko. He says that in North Korea's economic system, uh, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship is not merely banned, but it's criminalized. And even as the donju become a more important force, they operate in a very uh, gray zone in terms of legality and what they can do. So the question is, what could North Korean donju learn from entrepreneurs in the South who operate in a very different environment that's market-based? And the other hand, what could the uh, South Korean entrepreneur, North Korean entrepreneurs in the South learn from the donju? Um, in a sense, they seem like they live in totally different worlds. I remember a quote from uh, Professor Linkov saying that uh, North Korean entrepreneurs are like the fish that survive at the bottom of the ocean. They live in a very inhospitable environment but they survive because they know how to survive in that environment, but they cannot survive close to the top of the water because there is very competitive. So uh, what are the lessons that each group can uh, draw from the other given that they live in, in such a different environment? So thank you very much and uh, I'll stop here.
Randall, thank you. Uh, very stimulating. I'm going to turn back to Kwong maybe for some, some brief comments on that and he wants to make. And then I want to make sure we have uh, uh, the better part of 20 minutes to, uh, to, get, to go to the many questions we have from the audience. I'm going to add one we already have to Randall's comments because I think it's related. And it's also related to one question I want to get, get in there, which is for Kwong. Uh, I mean, as Randall talks, I mean, we talk about entrepreneurship, we talk about SMEs, but yeah, I mean, in the South Korean environment, aren't we talking about the same thing? And, and you know, one thing has always kind of struck me is, yeah, I mean, I, uh, as, as Randall says, the, the sort of view of South Korea is weak entrepreneurship, and yet SMEs are 87% are of, of, the, of the labor force. Um, so, you know, what are we actually talking about here in a way? Uh, does it, and, uh, and with respect to what sort of, you know, the lessons from North Korea, the experience in North Korea, Randall referenced the uh, Donju. We have one, uh, one question, one of our first ones um, that uh, says, do some of these North Koreans come with some experience in the Jangmadang in the informal market? And, and I guess, I'm not sure, you know, which of those are SMEs and which of those are entrepreneurship in the North Korean context, but maybe a little comment on, on those. Thank you, uh, thank you. Um... Uh, Randall, for your uh, very, very uh, insightful observations and the question, and, and Ambassador Stephen, and also the uh, the questions. Let me just say the uh, the data. We do have data. Uh, if you look at the uh, the annex of the report, very interesting. We just try to put up as much raw data as possible. Sixty three percent of those interviewed had experience business experience uh, in informal markets or formal mm -hmm. markets in North Korea. And even 22%, they actually have experience being some type of owners or being higher up in businesses. So that data is out there. The, the annex is very interesting. Um, regarding the information flow, um, uh, Randall, is it, that's a subject for another report. Uh, so it'll be fascinating to look into the information flow between uh, the two, uh, um, the, the, the uh, SME or entrepreneurial system. I'll, I'll get into that question, Ambassador Stevens. And so uh, that's uh, that there is an influence between them, and but I think that's why uh, um, and Dr. Andy Lankov was pointing out to that there. Uh, I think that the success of the South Korean entrepreneurs will, will be noticed, uh, and what the, what happens to them in South Korea will be noticed by uh, in, by inside. I'll just leave it at that. And and the um, entrepreneurs, we are. It's a very generic term. Uh, but SMEs includes uh, all the entrepreneurs, so people we, people have been using interchangeably. So we are referring to a similar uh, similar thing. SME is just a stage of different small, medium, and, and, and micro. So those are different sizes of firms. But um, yes, we are using interchangeably. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn to the questions because we have a lot of them, and uh, I'll. Uh... Uh, I mean, look to Kwong perhaps as a, a primary responder, but I, I would welcome comments from anyone, I'm sure, and uh, discussion among, uh, among yourselves. Uh, we have from Walter Streeter. Uh, you mentioned, Kwong, uh, that your sample size was 65% female. Uh, according to a Princeton University study, the North Korean refugee population is 80% female. I think you mentioned 80, 85. Uh, how does this gender influence the refugees' interest and success in entrepreneurship? Yeah, so uh, we have also different data, but similar direction that, that some people quote 75%. Uh, so it's hard to know, I, again, the data quality is, is a challenge. Um, so it, yes, it's a bit less than the overall population, but it's still in, this, in the general direction that the majority of entrepreneurs are female. Um, uh, so, so it's, I mean, I'm not sure there's any more we can add in, into this, but it, it is, something that as we design the, our entrepreneurship policies, uh, we should consider very much uh, gender sensitive uh, policies. They are targeting women entrepreneurs. Uh, they do have the different needs uh, such as care interruptions, uh, um, uh, the need for childcare and so forth. And, and in some cases uh, in Korea. So there, there are some specific needs uh, that we need to take into account when we're designing uh, specific policies for women entrepreneurs. Okay, um, from John Brandon, uh, are North Korean entrepreneurs engaged in one or two particular types of small businesses as opposed to others? In fact, I was kind of curious, uh, uh, some, some of the North Korean uh, refugees I've met have a business that has a bit of a North Korean brand, right? I mean, whether it's uh, uh, Nangmyeon or, or you know, something that plays on their, their North Korean identity. I wonder if you have any, any data on that. 
Um, but and to go on with uh, John's question, he said, uh, how has COVID-19 impacted North Korean entrepreneurs? Has the pandemic more adversely affected North Korean entrepreneurs as opposed to their South Korean uh, counterparts? Uh, most of the study was done, uh, at the, it was completed before the, we had a lot of data about COVID. So we couldn't, uh, this study didn't cover it that much. However, just hearing from different entrepreneurs, uh, um, uh, the ones we talked to, uh, they seem to be doing quite well, regardless of the COVID situation. As you know, Korea, a lot of businesses are still operating. It's still a challenge. It's very tough for the small businesses, but they're still operating. Um, in terms of the, and the flavor of the business, some of them are very much, there's no trace of North Korea. It's very much a local, local business. But one business is they have this uh, North Korean uh, uh, delivery, food delivery. So they, they sort of adapt North Korean menu and uh, they deliver it at your door, very, very creative services. Uh, one, another business had uh, very much a farm theme uh, where you, you get organic and pure and there's some sense of uh, wanting to capture that, that type of a raw North Korean uh, products and ingredients. So it was very, so they, some of them try to adapt some of their identity into their business model. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting, thank you. Um, Sue Ajo has a question that goes to uh, some of the recommendations and maybe teasing those out a bit more. Did, did you uncover key entrepreneurial skill sets that refugee entrepreneurs are interested in further developing and educational programs to strengthen their business expertise? Yeah, so, um, I mean, if you ask straight out uh, some of the key areas of skills, I mean, uh, they're very similar to other entrepreneurs such as marketing, um, and financial management and so forth. However, if you dig deeper a little bit in terms of what has, has really been, uh, uh, I think what, what we found is worked really well, is not so much um, modular training like marketing and accounting, but much more behavioral mindset, attitude, much more those type of training, have, uh, it seems to be much more uh, resonant uh, to the entrepreneurs. There's a methodological personal initiatives was pioneered by this German professor during East West Germany. And it was peer reviewed by the Science Journal uh, and compared to different entrepreneurship programs that showed to be much more uh, resonant, uh, resonant much more with the North Korean entrepreneurs, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm just gonna add on to that. I was saying, I, I have this impression of the, uh, the South Korean entrepreneurial or startup environment is, is, especially in the areas you're talking about, some of these service areas and uh, food service and so on is um, it's hyper -comp competitive, like everything in South Korea, right? And, and, and the problem becomes the, the sort of the, the distinction of, between brands before it's kind of swallowed up by a big chebol, right? So, I mean, so one year it's everybody goes into, actually there's some references in the movie Parasite into Taiwan cakes, right? And another year it's a certain kind of coffee and another year it's something else, or not even year, month. And everyone just scrambles to that and then, uh, and their failure rate's very high. Did you see North Korean uh, uh, entrepreneurs kind of falling into that pattern as well? Absolutely. Uh, Randall mm -hmm. made some excellent points about the South Korean SME structure, the industrial, the, the, the sector structure. So it is a lot policy related, but also it has to do with the structure of the large corporations and the relationship with the suppliers. Um, actually, Randall is probably familiar with this, but the wage differential between SMEs and, and the large companies is the largest in OECD. So there's a huge gap. There's no prestige in SMEs, even though uh, startup is cool. And that's the fine distinction that our younger people are going to these tech startups. It's becoming a little more cool, not as quite as cool as going to Samsung and other places. Uh, so uh, so I think the type of structural problems SME faces, uh, the North Koreans also faces, and probably to a, a harder, you know, in a deeper degree, because they lack those connections in South Korea. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bill Lovegrove has uh, two sort of specific questions. You know, in the report, uh, it talks about a cultural example of of the North Koreans uh, thinking that if you get a driver's license, it comes with a car. Um, but he's just asking for a clarification. Is that an expectation that everyone with a driver's license has a car or that you will, if you get a driver's license, you'll be given a car? It's one the car. latter, the you'll latter. be given a car. <laughs> right, okay, it turns out not to be the case. Yes. Um, okay, 
And can you discuss the, the gap between invoicing and payment? Uh, is this challenge particularly pronounced for the refugee entrepreneurs? I think you touched on this. And how does discrimination on this kind of thing come into play? Yeah, so I think this is a not unique problem to, to, to the North Korean entrepreneurs, but uh, people are promised to pay um, uh, when you're, it happens in the supply chain when a buyer uh, say they will pay or a supplier will say will deliver, it happens and the promise are not fulfilled. So the, uh, so managing the trust relationship in the value chain, managing suppliers and, 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 the, and the buyers is, is a big issue. Uh, some people start buying from you small, small uh, buy purchases and then uh, a few weeks later, they make a larger purchase, and then um, uh, I mean, then, then they they don't fulfill the contract. So that's uh, that's a very common problem uh, that the North Koreans are facing, which is systematic in in uh, small business in South Korea. Um, so building a more uh, trusted relationship, where, for example, supply chain financing, uh, credit facilities, more established buyers, where you know, there is more trust. I think those type of mechanisms and financial innovations are important. Yeah, thank you. Um, we had, I referenced an earlier question from, or it was from Robert Petrie about the Zhang Mahjong and experience there. Um, uh, Andrew Yeo, who's uh, at Catholic University, but now in Manila, is, is, uh, has a similar question. He's, and, and Scott touched on this a little bit, but, uh, but how transferable are the entrepreneurial business skills that North Korean refugees, especially the women, that they acquire from their experience uh, uh, with business and markets in North Korea? Uh, how transferable is that when they when they come to South Korea? Yeah, hi Andrew. Um, that's we we didn't cover that much into detail uh, in terms of transferability of the skills, but I can tell from my observation of. Um, that there's some real fire in their eyes uh, that uh, even I mean, the entrepreneurs in general, I love hanging out with them because they have this fire in the belly where uh, they will do anything to make it happen. But this is even more so with, with the North Korean, that's the sense. Uh, again, this is anecdotal, um, probably that's the best I can do. But I think uh, a lot of people at met as entrepreneurs can also relate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking about another movie now, Gukche Shijang, you know, which of course is about people coming from North Korea and, and, and you know, uh, populating the market and uh, Pusan. Uh, I mean, there is an historical resonance, this notion of this entrepreneurial spirit, you know, as part of the, uh, the tragedy of Korean division and the experience. So it's uh, kind of moving to think about it in the current context as well. Um, Don, uh, Below, I hope I have your name right. Uh, Peace Corps volunteer in Korea from 68 to 69, Sambe. Um, is the U in, in the US, many universities uh, have centers for growing small businesses as startup centers. Uh, would this work with South Korean universities or I, I, you mentioned, I think, or others mentioned that there are some efforts in this. What, what is working and what's not? I know there's been a lot of tries in terms of uh, startup, yeah. startups or... You know. Yeah, no, no, I think that's the right direction. And um, I'm not sure about universities, but there are uh, private uh, and, and, and some government sponsored um, accelerator and startup support. Uh, and I think some universities may be involved as well. Um, and these things is the right way to go. It's just, they're very recent. There's not enough data to evaluate how they're going uh, in, in, in terms of anything uh, meaningful. But I think it is, it is the right direction and um, I think uh, the preliminary lessons will be very useful. Um, I think uh, connecting these networks, the existing networks of accelerators and startup uh, uh, incubators with global and regional uh, partners, uh, it will be very enriching uh, for, um, especially with, with, uh, with, with other countries in Southeast Asia uh, and also with the US and, and, and also European uh, networks. Um, and that, this is already happening, but that, that this is a, a step in the right direction. You know, I'm also reminded, uh, you, you know, you made the, the tie as did uh, both Scott and Randall between kind of the challenges that South Korean entrepreneurs face as being in many ways very similar, a similar set of issues to what the North Korean entrepreneurs face. And what in the past, previous South Korean governments have have looked to local governments, this gets to another, you know, <laughs> longstanding but never realized uh, kind of national objective of some decentralization of economic activity and revitalization of the regions. 
Um, do you see that, did that come out at all in your study, a predilection for North Korean uh, refugee entrepreneurs to want to stay centered in Seoul, to find more success elsewhere, more support elsewhere, any observations or recommendations about that? Um, again, we didn't cover that aspect of the study. However, just in terms of, I mean, uh, uh, Scott and others may have also something to say, but it, it's, um, there's overall preference to be around Seoul. I mean, it's not just North Korea, it's just Korean uh, trade who wanted to be around the center. Uh, at the same time, the government has been also understand some incentives for um, for the North Korean entrepreneurs to go to the farm. So we have noticed people going to some farming activities um, uh, as well. Um, but without that, it would be mostly uh, people wanting to stay in the, in the in Seoul area. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I've got two more questions in the queue, which uh, I'll, I'm gonna get to, and then uh, maybe just take a few minutes at the end uh, for uh, any final comments from uh, any of our, our three panelists. Uh, Dylan Davis, previously at the Asia Foundation in Seoul, uh, asks, uh, what is the South Korean private sector doing to help build capacity for aspiring North Korean refugee entrepreneurs? Uh, does the private sector, especially the large conglomerates, have a role to play uh, versus government interventions? Yes, hi, Dylan. And I've, I've acknowledged that it was Dylan who initially uh, studied this work and um, and so thanks to a lot of his initial work that this work was, um, it was built. Um, the private sector is playing really a, a major role here. As I mentioned, most of the programs we found uh, has been through the private sector and foundations, uh, major corporate foundations. The Chebos, except those public, 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 uh, public foundations, it, it was very difficult to find data from Chebos. Uh, and our guess is that they do have some programs, uh, but uh, the data was not very easily accessible. Um, so so the, the, most of the programs we found um, were from the private sector um, funded. Uh, so some of the training, uh, some of the, a couple of accelerating and incubating programs, these are all mostly run by the private sector. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and final question I have here, and then I have one final one, and I'll ask you to comment, each of you to maybe to comment on as those or, or not, whatever else you'd like to conclude with. Uh, William Kim asks, this is perennial, how did, you, how did your survey respondents address themselves? Do they call themselves refugees, defectors, escapees? Did your survey respond self-imposed limitations on themselves for the fear of being judged as defectors or refugees? Uh, no, there, there was no labeling. They just uh, addressed as themselves as by their, their names. Oh, did we lose Ambassador Stevens? Maybe, um, do you think that we should just uh, go around with a couple of final observations? Um, yes, um, unless um, Ambassador Stephen comes back, please. Well, one thing that really sticks out to me from this particular discussion uh, is uh, the, the um, uh, the, the flow of North Korean entrepreneurs toward the service sector, knowing that that is a relatively low wage sector. And it makes me think that the issue of financing ends up being the critical differentiator. Uh, and so it leads me to think that maybe uh, the most effective approach to building North Korean entrepreneurship would actually be to combine a North Korea focused venture capital effort uh, with some kind of partnership with South Korean uh, partners who can help navigate uh, the regulatory uh, and uh, business environment within South Korea. Yeah, if you could just quickly comment uh, and, and Randall, feel free if you have anything else to add on that. Um, uh, the focus on services, uh, it also has to do with low barrier of entry. It's relatively easier to get in uh, into the service sector. There's also some 
some people here, some of the refugees we spoke, spoke with mentioned that this also has to do with the fact that a lot of the service sector, like logistics, for example, you don't have to face the, um, the, the customer. Uh, so they prefer to be in this IT, especially males. Uh, they, they prefer to be in this hidden uh, sectors where there, you don't have to um, show, show too much of the interaction. Uh, having said that, some of the people that are into uh, food delivery and more of the client facing role is pretty impressive. So you have really this, 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 this big gap. Uh, but uh, but there, there are probably a combination of low barriers of entry and, and some cultural uh, factors influencing those decisions. I, I would agree with that. Um, if you look at South Korean women, what areas they go into as entrepreneurs, they focus on education related uh, uh, businesses, uh, food, restaurants, and uh, hotels. And these are, as Scott said, where entry barriers are very low. You don't need a lot of capital. There's also a lot of turnover because it's extremely competitive. And so the turnover, the churning is very rapid. So it's the most difficult part of the um, SME sector. Just make one uh, general comment. Someone mentioned the table. Of course, in South Korea, uh, the KFTC spends much of their time trying to find out why do the Chebol, in a sense, exploit the SME. So that's a very fraught relationship between the Chebol and the smaller companies that they work with. And that is the most common complaint that you hear from SMEs is that they are not paid or when business goes bad, the Chebol cut the price they pay to their suppliers. So that's a very complicated relationship. And finally, on, on risk, um, I used to visit the Korea Venture Business Association um, somewhere in um, in Seoul, I can't remember, Song Baku, I think. Um, but their view of, of risk and venture was much different than for an American. I mean, they told me one time that 98% of our ventures succeed. And for me, having been influenced, you hear about Silicon Valley, you're maybe 10% or 20% succeed. So there was kind of a, a risk averseness in the South Korean entrepreneurial um, spirit. And, and among the North Koreans, I think they're really the ones taking the risk because they start off with without these connections, with uh, cultural problems, lack of capital. So I think these are the biggest risk takers that we have in South Korea. And I think uh, they should, uh, we should try to make a good environment, uh, provide the tools for them to succeed. Randall, thank you. I'm back and apologies for uh, uh, going off screen there. We need a, a Korean SME here in Washington, DC to start and show us a way to deliver reliable internet. Um, I, I've learned a lot from this. I, I think it's been a terrific group. Uh, Kwong, congratulations uh, to you and to the Asia Foundation on this report. Uh, clearly, it's going to stimulate continued discussion. Uh, and I'm glad we've been able to start it today. I want to thank Randall Jones and Scott Snyder for your insights from your deep experience and everyone who's participated. Thank you. Thank you.